Action one, inspiring action. Look up, because you never know what you will see. Hi, my name is Shin Ge, and I'm the host of SG2 On Space, the only weekly space show here in Houston, with Action One Media Group support every Thursday night. So, my goal here is to educate the public in terms of space science, space flight, um, physics, astronomy, ET, you know, all that cool jazz, and occasionally about aliens as well. Um, so, STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, arts, um, since that's part of the creative aspect and mathematics is very important to me and I feel like Action One Media's goal is aligned with mine so together we hope to um, encourage the the knowledge and especially the passion and the interest in outer space uh, in our Houston community tune in to SG2 on space on Thursdays at 8 p.m. US Central Time look up because you never know what you will see Okay, so this is Shenga. That's who I am. Welcome to SG2 on Space, the only weekly space show here in Houston um, at the Action One Media Studios you can see behind me. Action One Media Group, a um, well entertainment slash media company here in Houston, uh, which you can find at www.weara1.com. Of course, if you're listening to the show, I hope you're already following me at facebook.com slash the Shen Show. If not, you should be. Uh, also, on YouTube, look up SG2 on Space. Also there. So, uh, a couple announcements before we begin. Uh, this is episode 43. Primarily, I'm going to be talking about some interesting developments in rocketry that's going on in our country, uh, as well as uh, overseas. So look forward to that and obviously round it up at the end with aliens oh my gosh all right sorry i just want to jump into that but gotta cover some rocket stuff first um but look <clears throat> so patreon page has cha has changed so it is now facebook not facebook patreon.com slash sg2 on space so um p-r-t-e-o-n.com slash sg the number two on space. All right, so not only did the URL change, uh, the prizes also changed as well. So if you're becoming a patron now, this may actually motivate you more, uh, especially since there's now <clears throat> the Earth price of $30 or more per month. Um, so if you are, there's only six slots, by the way, uh, and, and so that will allow you to have um, <clears throat> a short video or audio clip that would be played um, weekly on the show during you know during one of the two breaks that we have uh, and you can talk about yourself your company organization wh whatever really um, and so this would be on played on the show um, and then the other one the Mars option you can get a longer clip um, about the same thing you your company your organization what or whatever cause you're you're looking for Hopefully it's related to space or technology. Um, I, w I wouldn't say I'm terribly selective, but that would be my preference in regards to the show. And so this gives you an opportunity to, you know, for you to uh, have listeners listen to you as well, not just me, right? So um, 
you know, if this appeals to you, or if you just want to hey, say, hey, you know, I just want to donate a few bucks, you know, then you can get a shout out during the show, okay? And that's a moon level. So up to you guys. Uh, just go to patreon.com slash SG2 on space. So, um, well, let's see. The other thing I decided <clears throat> is that I'm going to give you a book of the week, actually. Because I tend to read a lot, and I figured I, I, I share more beyond than just with friends. So today, um, the book that I found that is called Einstein and the Total Eclipse, okay? Einstein and the Total Eclipse. So <clears throat> some of you guys may not know, but when Einstein developed his theory, general theory of relativity, not everybody was on board, right? People are like, this is a wacko. Okay, sure, the mathematics may sound right, but where's the solid proof, right? So it turns out that you can use solar eclipses to actually show that uh, light bends. Okay, so, um, and this book is about a famous example of this opportunity. So there are two exp the, the two expeditions to observe the bending of starlight by the sun which was predicted by Einstein's general theory, theory of relativity, um, from Sobral, Sobral in northern Brazil and the island of Principe in the Gulf of Guinea during the eclipse of May 29th, 1990. So you can see uh, gravity distorts space-time, right? Um, and since light is traveling, it actually distorts the pathway of light <laughs> because everything travels through the space-time. So norm. So if you have a starlight in the distance, you actually see the light rays bend. I mean, you barely see it, but you could detect the difference. All right. Now, if the sun is shining and bright, okay, the sun's light pretty much overpowers the starlight, so you can't really tell much of a difference. However, um, if there's an eclipse, then you can observe the light from the distant stars, and the sun's light is mostly occluded, so then you can actually get the data and show that, you know, prove that relativity is real, which this did, which is amazing. So, um, yeah. Anyways, recommend this book, Einstein, The Total Eclipse by Peter Coles, uh, C-O-L-E-S, and it's a very short book, so it should be an easy read. All right. So, <clears throat> today, like I said, I'm going to talk about new rockets, new propulsion from uh, starting out with something unconventional and then going to the more conventional, all right? But guys, we got to take a break. So when we come back, let's talk about nuclear propulsion, shall we? some of the other things you got going on. Man. Absolutely. So uh, thank you for having me. I feel like uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> some, like celebrity. <laughs> no, yeah, it's just the shades, man. Just shades. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think like 2000. Put your money where your community is. Get in the action. Action one, independent thinkers working together, inspiring action in media. Get in the action, inspire today. Join us by being a sponsor at weareaone.com. Growing up as a black kid in New Jersey, all I ever wanted to do was be a pro athlete. All of my role models were black athletes. And every time I would stare out the window and look at the sky and wonder what I'd be in the future, it always had to do with me catching some crazy football and, and scoring a touchdown. And when it came to the point that I was told that I would not be able to play on an organized sports team for the rest of my life, it was something that I really didn't even know how to stomach in the moment. 
And I remember walking out of my cardiologist's office and just sitting in the hallway and breaking down for a few minutes just because it, it, it was something that I just couldn't plan for and couldn't account for. And I realized that in that moment, my entire life was going to be changed. And all of those dreams and, and hopes and aspirations that I had were going to go out of the window. back in the studio. This is Shane Gug, your host for SGT on Space um, today, episode 43. Um, so like I said, before we went on break, I said we were going to talk about a different kind of propulsion uh, than, the, than the standard one that you guys may know. You know, when you think about rocket firing, you're thinking, boom, giant uh, flame balls coming out of the end of a nozzle. You're thinking chemical propulsion, right? Basically solids. Uh, or, or liquids, right? Some explosions in chamber and inject out. Well, it turns out that back in the day, particularly in the 60s and 70s, actually, NASA was working on uh, possibly using nuclear propulsion. Now, that, that idea was uh, mothballed for the last few decades, but recently, actually, there has been renewed interest from NASA. And in fact, um, during the sixth meeting of the National Space Council on August 20th, 2019, um, NASA Administrator Jim Brennenstein lauded the potential of this uh, nuclear thermal propulsion, which would pretty much harness the heat generated, the temperature generated by fission reactors to accelerate, propel accelerate propellants to tremendous speeds, okay? And it would cut down going to Mars by half the time. Instead of nine months, say, it would take maybe four months or three months. So um, there's about $100 million, I think, being thrown into this program now, possibly more in the future. Um, so let's watch a little short video, actually, which uh, has better graphics than I can do with my hands. First thermonuclear bomb is tested. In the same year, Von Braun publishes Das Mars Project, a comprehensive technical workup for a large scale space program that will become the blueprint for NASA's Mercury, Gemini. And Apollo projects. In 1955, Paramount Pictures releases Conquest of Space. It too is based on Von Braun's planetary plans. At Los Alamos National Lab, Project Rover begins. It's an effort to harness nuclear fission to drive spaceships at constant thrust. Project Orion, a different approach to nuclear rockets, starts testing hardware. The idea is to detonate atomic bombs behind a ship to push it along. It's called pulsed plasma wave propulsion. Outrageous as it seems, this method could offer rapid transport to Mars and the rest of the solar system. The U.S. Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Application, NERVA program, accumulates 17 hours of live engine test time. It raises hopes for Mars missions and moon bases. In the Soviet Union, engineers are working on nuclear thermal rockets of their own. Soviet leaders have the specific goal of making Mars a politically red planet. The Soviets try several times to send probes to Mars. But they get no closer than 197,000 kilometers. 
and achieve very little science. Someday, a manned trip to Mars and return may become the mission assignment. To answer that challenge, Kraft Ericke, a visionary German-American engineer, introduces the idea of ganging together clusters of nuclear rockets. He argues that his modular approach could bring Mars and Venus within reach as early as the 1970s. Ericke passionately believes that human expansion throughout the solar system is a fundamental right. And that we are at our most dignified when we apply the laws of physics to elevate and protect human freedom. And we're back, so hopefully that was a rather illuminating insight into uh, nuclear <clears throat> propulsion. Now, the video talked about, um, weirdly enough, I guess we ran out of creative names. So, so back in the 50s, or rather early 60s, there was a program called Project Orion, which is completely different from our Orion program. Our Orion program is a spacecraft, which is to the moon, right? Okay, that that's... This Project Orion was a nuclear propulsion program where you're basically having a giant metal plate and detonating nuke bombs behind the plate and the explosion creates a shock wave and pushes the spacecraft forward. All right, which is crazy, but they actually did do some of the t those tests back then, okay? The, the latest ones that are, we're working on that the government, uh, that NASA is funding is, is not that. That one's a little too wild. Uh, instead, it's what's known as nuclear thermal propulsion. So you're using a fission reaction, which is what you have in, say, any nuclear reactor, right? And you will produce um, massive amounts of heat. Um, and then you could use that to accelerate stuff outside of a nozzle, right? So accelerate propellant, such as hydrogen, to, uh, to a huge amount of speed. And hence, you, you, know, you create a huge amount of thrust. All right, so so you know, it's it should be um, yeah. I mean, hopefully we keeps get fun getting funding and it works right. So currently, uh, NASA is contracting this company, this nuclear uh, power company actually called BWX Technologies. Um, so BWX Technologies is actually creating, uh, working on building the, the fuel required. So it wouldn't need to be as actually enriched as the ones used for nuclear reactors, all right? Um, and so, so building the fuel and as well as figuring out, uh, you know, the engine, right? So let's see what happens. Who knows? On the more conventional side of things, um, <coughs> stuff is moving ahead. So for instance, um, the Delta rocket, okay, Delta IV. Some of you guys may have heard of this. Uh, United Launch Alliance, which has been around for quite some time, uh, which launches a lot of American uh, military and government uh, satellites, but are also, you know, do some of the stuff for, for NASA as well as commercial companies as well, right, if you want to get something up there. Well, uh, this has been a long time in coming, but they are transitioning to their next type of rocket called the Vulcan, all right? So they're shuttling, shuttling. They are retiring the Atlas um, as well as the Delta. So the Atlas V and the Delta IV are gonna be replaced by the Vulcan Centaur, all right? So um, now you do get a chance, you can see the last time last time you you can there's going to be um um the delta four medium rocket you have one last chance to watch it launch and this would be launched on august 22nd uh, obviously 2019 and a 27 minute window that starts at 9 a.m u.s eastern time blasting off from cape canaveral air force station in florida all right and this this last launch of this rocket this delta four rocket it's going to carry uh, the second satellite in next generation constellation of global positional s global positioning system, better known as GPS. All right. So um, 
you know, UIA, you know, I launched Alliance, has been around since 2002. So what is it? It's, it's almost an 18 year history right now. Launched a total of 134 missions, 100% success rate. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible, right? Um, so the Vulcan Centaur is expected to be operational by 2021. Um, last fall, so fall of 2018, UOA announced that, okay, so these Atlas V and Delta Force used actual rock, um, Russian rocket engines, and <coughs> we don't seem to uh, want to continue to use Russian rocket engines. So this Vulcan Centaur is going to use the BE-4 engine, um, which is developed by, which is being developed by Blue Origin. All right. Uh, actually, yeah. So essentially, we're not going to use a Russian-made RD-180 engine due to political political reasons. Not that it doesn't work well, but we'd rather use American ones. Okay. So. Um, now, the, the factory is already undergoing changes, so uh, they're on schedule, that's what it seems like. Um, <coughs> now, the, most of the components um, that, that is, that is uh, going to be on Vulcan is actually already flown on Atlas or Delta. The exception, obviously, is the main, region, main engine, which is the Blue Origin BE-4. So it will be testing on the ground before Vulcan's first launch, though. Um, so the BE-4, give you a quick background, it runs on liquid oxygen and liquid methane. It's been in development since 2011. Um, so BE-4 actually will not fly until the Vulcan flies. However, that sounds like it's a risk, right? So, but apparently um, the CEO, Peller, believes it's not a risk, so, you know. Hey, UOA has had a 100% success rate, so I'm sure um, their new rocket would do just fine. All right. Um, and we'll keep you guys up to date as uh, things move ahead over there. Now, switching over to the government side of things, how about the Space Launch System, SLS? Remember, SLS is the one that's supposed to take us to the moon and beyond, right? Mars. Okay. So... Uh, it turns out that the biggest rocket that's ever going to be in existence, unless you count the SpaceX one, that, whenever that gets done. All right. So the first flight of the SLS, the Space Launch System, um, is going to got delayed. Now it's going to launch in early 2021 rather than 2020. All right. So the first launch of SLS on a mission called Artemis One uh, was formally you know, schedule for the second half of 2020, a date that's already been delayed two years. It was supposed to be two years before 2020, so that means 2018. All right, so now it may be delayed to 2021, all right? Now, um, the NASA Administrator, Brennan Stein, says that he doesn't think this is going to be a serious delay. Uh, I mean, it doesn't gonna, it's not going to affect Artemis II. Um, so, if, as he said, on August 3rd, if Artemis 1 launches no later than mid-2021, there will be no impact to Artemis 2, which is launching in 2022. All right. So, now, he did add that he would like to have new leadership in place and committed to integrate schedule before committing a date. Uh, remember, the SLS is required for its the Orion capsule, which is a bigger, like, that's like our modern day version of the Apollo capsule, right? That can only fit in SLS, so we can't do a lunar mission, um, at least a government funded lunar mission until the SLS is complete, all right? So just a note there. Um, hopefully things will go on schedule and not be delayed any further. <clears throat> yeah, so we shall see. I mean, it is a very complicated uh, rocket, so, you know. On the commercial side of things, um, things seem to be going faster there um, because especially, I don't know, I guess that's how it works with some of these companies, you know. They, they just, they just want to go ahead. Okay, so the, ro the one, one company, for instance, is Rocket Lab, all right. So Rocket Lab 
interesting history, right? Peter Beck, he is a New Zealander, and I believe he's an American citizen as well. So he founded the U.S. and New Zealand-based aerospace company Rocket Lab, all right? So they have two divisions, one in New Zealand, one in America, and their whole aim was to reduce the cost of individual launches, especially for small satellites, all right? Um, so his original idea was to create really cheap uh, small rockets that could send up payloads with very regular frequency, right? Not like SpaceX or Blue Origin. SpaceX and Blue Origin focused on, you know, bigger stuff, bigger rockets that's able to be reused. So Peter Beck didn't really care about reusability because that increases the cost of an individual rocket, right? However, recently he changed his mind, all right? Um, he revealed that his company plans to recover and reuse the first stage of its electron launch vehicle. Uh, the reason being that they feel like if it's not reusable, you know, you launch it once and you got to rebuild a whole rocket again, right? And it turns out they thought they could do it fast enough to keep churning out these smaller rockets. But looking at it again, um, he, you know, as he told uh, in a recent interview, he said, for a long time, I said we weren't going to do reusability. This is one of those occasions where I have to eat my hat. All right. So, um, Rocket Lab will be retrieving their first stage boosters in midair using a helicopter, which is kind of weird. I wish there was an animation on that. I'm sure I can find one later. Um, so it's a slight variation on the skyhook idea. Um, so Rocket Lab has been doing about a year of launches now, so it's not like they don't have any history. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're just, a, just a quick back, stepping back, their first launch was from the Launch Complex 1 in the Mahia Penis Penis Peninsula at the eastern tip of New Zealand's North Island, right? Um, so, in any case, there's two stages, two phases for their plan. In phase one, Rocket Lab is going to recover a full electron first stage from the ocean downrange from what they call Launch Complex 1. The spent booster will be then shipped back to the company's production facility in Auckland, New Zealand, where it'll be you know refurbished and then ready for relaunch at a later date. Phase two will consist of electrons first stage being captured in midair by a helicopter and then transported back to launch complex one for refurbish and relaunch. Clearly, phase two requires more finesse than phase one. All right. So Rocket Lab plans to begin phase one sometime in 20. 20. Um, in the meantime, they, they'll conduct test flights, see if Electron's first stage can actually survive the process of re-entry, right? That would suck if it can't. Um, so, now they, they, they have recently started testing to do that. So, um, any case, so the main challenge for the first stage, first stage is a sudden deceleration it will experience during re-entry, all right? Um, it, to give you an idea, it has to go from Mach 8.5, which is like 6,500 miles per hour, 6,500 miles per hour, all right, or 10,500 kilometers per hour for those metric units, folks. It has to go from Mach 8.5, so 8.5 times the speed of sound, to basically zero in a minute and 15 seconds. Like, that is insane, all right? So it's like you go from eight, over eight times the speed of sound to stopping in like a little than more than a minute. I mean, um, I guess if you're a UFO or alien spacecraft, that'd be easy. But for what we know, that's pretty darn hard. All right. So to do this, the first stage is going to have to dissipate a lot of a lot of energy. Right. And how are they going to do that? I eh, don't know. Um, who knows? Not sure yet. But. If he's going to follow SpaceX, what SpaceX did with Spa Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, then you're going to have a bunch of engines firing, all right, to slow it down. All right. Um, now, but that is, you know, yeah. Now, the reason you're going to use a helicopter, I think, I think the reason is because um, the, the Electron rocket is much, much smaller than the Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy. 
and hence you really can't carry that much propellant in it, right? So Falcon 9 Falcon Heavy could expend extra propellant to slow the thing down. Um, Electron Rocket, if it does that, then, I mean, it just doesn't have enough space to carry it, all right? And then it wouldn't have, it basically defeat its purpose of being super light rocket, right? So I think it, it would slow down to a certain point, but, and, and then a helicopter could, you know, could get it. So that, that may be why. And it's probably gonna have to use like design stuff like airfoils or chutes or something. So to help it slow down further. All right. Um, anyways, its ultimate aim is not to reduce launch prices, surprisingly enough, uh, which is what I first thought, but rather increase the company's launch rate without having to expand its factory, right? So um, basically the reason is that they can't build their engines fast enough. So they want to reuse their engines. But if you're still paying the same cost for those satellite companies who wants to go with them, just remember that. It's not going to help reduce your costs. Okay, so let's jump over to the other side of the pond because uh, the, the Rocket Lab is not the only small rocket company or building small rockets, all right? So um, on the other side of the pond, or rather the world, okay, so I'm going to talk about these Chinese people, which um, so there's a <coughs> Smart Dragon 1, all right? It reaches orbit with the first launch, and this is on August 19th. All right, August 19th, actually no, sorry, August 17th, 2019. Um, so it launched from the Zhou Chuan uh, launch facility in northwestern China. So the <coughs> Smart Dragon 1, uh, GLM-1, four-stage solid propellant rocket developed by China Rocket Company, LTD, which is a commercial spin-off from the launch vehicle manufacturer China Aerospace and Science Technology Corporation CASC, which is pretty much like our version of, say, Lockheed Martin or, or UOA, for instance. Okay. So, um, anyways, so JL-1 lifted off from the transporter erector launcher at Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center at 12.11 a.m. Eastern August 12, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, U.S. Eastern Time, on August 17th, 2019, okay? So um, it's, you know, 19 and a half meters tall, one and a half, no, one, 1 1.2 meters diameter, 23.1 metric tons. It's considered pretty small, okay? So it carries 65 kilograms in total, so multiply that by two, that gives you pounds. So 2.2, actually, okay? So say 140 pounds, all right? So the launch carried a um, 140-pound satellite called Tianshan-1, which is for remote sensing, communications, and navigation, uh, along with two smaller payloads, <coughs> into a 529, 560-kilometer 500, sun-synchronous orbit. Okay, and just to give you a bit of orbital mechanics here, so these are elliptical orbits, right? So remember, an ellipse, a circle has a radius, an ellipse, uh, ellipse, well, Ellipse is not a circle. Okay, ellipse has, it's like a squash circle. You can kind of think of it like that. So it's 529 by 560 kilometers. And no, your eye is not an ellipse. Um, in these, ellipse has two focal points, okay? Darn it, if I only have a whiteboard. But point is, 529 by 560 kilometers basically means at the closest approach to Earth, it's 529 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, okay? And then the furthest away is 560 kilometers away from the surface of the Earth. Okay, uh, sorry, at the furthest away. Yeah. So, sun synchronous orbit. Sun synchronous orbits are orbits as a 98 degree inclination with respect to the Earth. Um, oh, okay. I'm just like, all right. Point is, sun synchronous is a highly desirable orbit by a lot of satellites because. It is always in the view of the sun. And remember, how do satellites power themselves? Mostly by solar panels. So, sun synchronous orbit is a very nice orbit in that it will perpetually pretty much be able to be powered by the sun. All right? So, um, which is great. That's a lot of satellites do that. All right. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, okay, this might be better. It is almost a polar orbit, so 98 degrees. A polar orbit would be going through the north and south pole, right? Earth, 
Okay, this is North Pole, this is South Pole. So that'd be a polar orbit. Uh, this might be a sun synchronous orbit, all right? Gives you an idea, all right? So, um, in any case, why is it 98.6 degrees? Did I just say 0.6 degrees? Okay, well, it doesn't need to be that accurate. Okay, around 98 degrees. Um, well, okay, that, that gets super complicated. And let's not go there. Except I, I want to go there anyway, actually. So brief detour. Um, it turns out that the that the Earth is is kind of um, <clears throat> there's there's Earth has a bulge. So due to the uh, what do you call it conservation of angular momentum, the Earth actually has a bulge. So it's kind of fat in the middle, right? So this equatorial bulge actually perturbs inclined orbits, all right? So it causes the orbital plane of the spacecraft to what's known as process, process, P-R-E-C-E-S-S, -E -E -S, with the desired rate, okay? So in other words, what happens is that um, you, you're not going to say this is, say you're in this orbit. You're not going to be perpetually doing this. You're eventually going to be like that, 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 okay? Now... It, it does turn out that if you do exactly the sun synchronous orbit, you're actually following that precession level, all right, that amount of precession. So you end up being pretty much the same place, so to say, relatively speaking. All right, let me uh, stop talking about this. <clears throat> that was a, maybe a little too much. All right, so uh, point is, this Chinese company is doing that, all right, and they launched two other smaller satellites, which are made by small satellite companies from China. So great, lots of private space companies from China, My, Mino, Mino Space and Ada Space, all right, the, two of those small ones. All right, one of them is called Tianxi-2, and the other one is Star Age 5, all right? Um, now, this is not the first successful launch by, of, a, of a small launch vehicle by a Chinese company. Um, there were a couple before then. So the Chinese private company iSpace, remember I talked about it last month in July. Um, and, the, and before that, it was by one space in March and the landscape base in October last year. Granted, iSpace was the first one that actually succeeded, but hey, you know, th there have been attempts in the past. So um, there's a bunch of <coughs> small satellite, not small satellite, small rocket companies, all right? And... Um, this one's thirty thousand dollars per kilogram, which may sound like as a lot, but for satellite launches, that's actually not that much. All right. So if uh, if you want to shell out thirty thousand dollars and your satellite weighs a kilogram, which is about two point two pounds, go ahead. Chinese would do it for you, or say Rocket Lab would do it for you, or one of these other companies. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about some other stuff. Okay. Chandrayaan 2, right? This is totally different. I'm done talking about rockets for now. All right. For today, I'm done talking about rockets. So Chandrayaan 2, uh, special topic here, and I think it's really cool. So uh, <coughs> India has recently launched a spacecraft with a lander and a rover to the moon. All right? which is awesome. So, <clears throat> I mean, they went straight from just orbiting around the moon, which is Chandrayaan-1, to Chandrayaan-2, all right? So now, recently, just yesterday, uh, Chandrayaan-2 has entered orbit around the moon, and it is taking photos of the moon. And it's quite spectacular. Um, to, to be more precise, I entered the orbit actually on August 19th, but local time August 20th, India time. Okay, you get it. All right. Um, so it took about almost a month since, you know, July 22nd to get to the moon. Reason being that, um, you know, it didn't really have <clears throat> a lot of fuel. So it did kind of a spiral circular orbit out towards the moon versus just a straight shot, like say what Apollo did or like the Chinese. Um, so, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, which runs the Chandrayaan-2 mission, has now released the spacecraft's first image of the moon taken from orbit. Image was snapped about 1,650 miles above the lunar surface 
on Wednesday, August 21st. And it shows, uh, you know, Paul Crater, Mary Orientalis, and some other ones. Um, so might as well show a little clip that shows what, you know, what they saw. What did the, you know, what did the spacecraft see, right? So, back to the moon. Sorry, I meant back to the studio. <clears throat> um, any case, as you can probably see, saw in the video, it is actually not landing on either the Apollo site or Mary or Tally, which would be funny if it lands right on top of Apollo, but nobody's doing that. Um, it's going to the moon's south pole, and it's going to land there on September 6th or September 7th, the, the Indian mission control time, right? Uh, where, why did it choose the South Pole? Well, based on findings from Chandrayaan-1, the one that was just an orbiter, right? It spotted water, ice, frozen, and permanently shadowed craters near the lunar South Pole. And so India built a second mission, added a landing component, follow up on that, right? Now, please note that um, although this India will become the fourth country to complete that feat after Soviet Union, U.S., and China, uh, their lander is and rover uh, are, for better or worse, not designed to survive the frigid cold of the moon. So it's only going to last one lunar day, and then it's going to die. Uh, hopefully that day lasts for a long time. I am not exactly sure what that is, but in any case, <clears throat> that's that. Um, I'm done talking about all this because what I really want to talk about is aliens or really astrobiology but i'll just call it aliens but we got to take a break first so when we come back let's talk about strange stuff are you still here go on and subscribe get in action yo we back at it again baby Get in the action. Three. Get in the action. Tell me what is the deal. Tell me what is the deal. So I challenge you today to start strong. Get in the action. Tell me what is the deal. Cause I'm calling for you. Get in the action. Can you feel that? See, I'm calling for you. Can you feel that? Put your money where your community is. Get in the action at weareA1.com. Look up because you never know what you will see. 
Hi, my name is Shenge, and I'm the host of SG2 on Space, the only weekly space show here in Houston, with Action One Media Group support every Thursday night. So, my goal here is to educate the public in terms of space science, space flight,、um, physics, astronomy, ETs, you know, all that cool jazz, and occasionally about aliens as well. Um, so, STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, arts,、uh, since that's part of the creative aspect, and mathematics is very important to me. And I feel like Action One Media's goal is aligned with mine. So together, we hope to、um, encourage the the knowledge and especially the passion and interest in outer space、uh, in our Houston community. Tune in to SG2 on Space on Thursdays at 8 p.m. U.S. Central Time. Okay, and we are back in the studio of Action One Media, and you're listening to SG2 on Space, episode forty-three, where primarily we've been talking about rocketry, rockets, nuclear th- thermal propulsion, nuclear propulsion in general. Uh, the latest shift from the ULA launch vehicles,、um, retirement of Delta IV and Atlas V to you know、uh, the Vulcan, and among a number of other things. All right, in, in the Indian、uh, recent images of the moon from Chandrayaan II orbiter. All right, but enough of all that stuff. Wait,、right? forget it. So what's most important right now is knowing that apparently NASA has been hiding the fact that there's alien towers and statues on Mercury. According to an UFO expert, which leads me to wonder how you become a UFO expert. Like, do you just go dig around NASA, you know, image archives, figure out like this looks like a alien structure, and government say, I I don't know how you become a UFO expert. But interesting thing is,、um, <clears throat> news articles always say like. He may call himself a UFO expert. That's why we call him a self-proclaimed UFO expert. Okay, Scott Warren. All right, he owns this website called ET Database. All right,、uh, and for you guys interested, it is etdatabase.com. Literally. All right. So,、um, ET Database. You know, he clearly goes around and tracks it, not just him, other people too. But you know,、uh, basically identifies. Signs of ETs,、uh, which from pictures or or people's accounts or like videos or whatever else. So if you go on this website, you will see quite a lot of weird stuff. All right, supposedly like this is a sign, this photograph. Okay, so in this particular case, um, so you know, no, NASA launched a robotic space probe, right, called Mariner 10,、uh, back in 1973. So The purpose was to study the characteristics of Mercury and Venus. So the course of the mission it lasted for about a year and four months, and it took various photos of the of Mercury and Venus from the orbit. One particular photo that caught Warren's attention was that of a crater on Mercury. So the UFO expert、uh, said that he saw a towering structure somewhere near the middle of the crater. So based on the size of the crater. Uh, which he estimated about 10 kilometers long. The structure would be about three kilometers tall.、Um, aside from that, he also spotted another structure in the photo. So located left of the tower was a structure that represented, that resembled a statue of an individual that's praying. All right. So this led him to believe that the tower and statue may have a religious significance for the aliens that you know built and used them. So、uh, he thinks it may have served as a temple for ETs or as a station for alien vessels.、Um, I don't know what to think here. I mean, you're just gonna have to look at the image. But remember, this ba- is back in the 1970s. Their, their cameras are terrible. I, I mean, at least I think so.、Um, so, gosh, you know. But you, who knows? I mean, go take a look. Maybe you will see somebody praying. All right, <clears throat> I'm not gonna discount it, but at the same time, I'm not saying I believe it. Okay.、Uh, speaking of believing stuff,、uh, remember that Area 51 guy 
well, you know, they're not storming Area 51 anymore, but apparently the festival in Rachel, Nevada is happening no matter what. So the local residents have no choice but to stomach it. All right. So, uh, and that that is going to happen on September 20th, 2019. Uh, and they are really going to be in trouble, not from aliens, but from the fact that the town is tiny. And, like, they're probably, uh, I don't know where they're going to, you know, do their business, let's just say. So, where are they going to eat? All that. Who knows? We shall see what happens. Um, so, but... You know, we shall see. That'd be interesting. I do not plan to go. At least I don't think so. Got other plans. But if you guys don't have plans, maybe you should go into the desert on September 20th. And join those 2 million other Facebook users. Which I'm sure not all of them will go. But you, you at least have some people. right? Okay. That aside, speaking of places to go, um, I thought this was really interesting that... <clears throat> there's this website out there called Liminal Earth and it is recently only recently uh, created, it did not exist last year guys, or even last month for that matter um, Liminal Earth L-I-M-I-N-A-L Earth, it's a web based mapping tool designed to track all things paranormal and clearly somehow UFOs are in there I do not consider UFOs paranormal or aliens, but they should not be in the same category as ghosts and fairies, all right? Like, why? Wizards? Okay, but somehow they are, all right? So you go on this website, and it tracks it. You can put down, oh, I spotted this thing here, and then, you know, like, tag your geo-coordinate or whatever, right? Something like that. And it tracks you, and you can, you can so it's, a, it's an interactive map where you can read other people's accounts. You can filter them. So you could say filters are classic UFO. That's hilarious. Classic. Okay. Classic UFO. Cryptoids. Dark forces. Oh, my gosh. High weirdness. Mythologies. Straight up ghosts. Strange animals. Thin places. Time distortions. Or visions. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> some of them seems weirder than others. And I don't know why UFOs has a classic in front of it. But seems kind of cool so they, they explain what classic ufos are which are close encounters and sightings okay and then the one that was really weird thin places when i saw that i was like what the heck is thin places right like what is that like a thin person it turned out those are and i might be very interested in those magic fountains portals plant sigils ley lines Ooh, see for me, just a personal thing, okay? You guys may not know this, but besides UFOs, the other thing I, I daydream a lot about um, is um, is other dimensions and worlds. All right, actually, you guys may know this already. All right, since I have talked about traveling to other universes and people who said they have and so on and so forth. So one of the things I look for is portals, right? Um, I've talked on the show before about people step driving a car and they're suddenly in a different world and then they come back like like those three girls who got lost in the desert and they got chased by those cars that look like eggs okay and then they they they, they got scared and came back and their tire was like a million miles away all right point is um these things do happen so it'd be cool to find out those places and if you go there maybe you end up somewhere else which would be kind of cool so uh, yeah um I, I'll let you guys know if I actually decide to go to any of those places. Anyways, so just check it out. This might be really cool. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the, the other site, as I keep mentioning, um, is that new fork site, N-U-F-O-R-C, which that, that one is only if you are, you know, tracking N-U-F-O-R-C.org if you're tracking UFOs. So I've been seeing if the latest August one has come out yet, but no, there's only July reports. 396 counts, though, of reportings in July of sightings. So not bad. That's actually um, – there's been quite a lot this year. So, Or maybe people just know more about it. In any case, um, I'm afraid we have reached the end of this. All right. Um, thank you, guys. <clears throat> As noted, follow me. Facebook.com slash The Shen Show. Um, 
Action One Media. Be sure to follow them as well. This has been episode 43. Oh, and please support me. Patreon.com. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash SG2 on space. All right. Uh, all right. If you don't remember anything else I said, just remember this. Don't forget to look up because you never know what you will see. Peace out. Peace, brother Atum Ryan. You tuned in the Action One Network. <laughs>